me see. I'm gonna, so going live. All right, so share my screen. All right, so I am just going to let, give it a, a minute or so to let people come into the room and then we'll, we'll get started. Megan and I had talked about maybe some music for tonight, but I forgot, <laughs> so sorry. <laughs> we get to sit here in awkward silence while we- That's fine. <laughs> we can, we we can like hum. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Right. So I think I can go ahead and, um, and get started on introductions. So good evening, everyone. I'd like to begin by acknowledging the traditional custodians of the land I am tuning in from today, the Monica Nation, and pay respects to their elders past, present, and emerging. I would also like to acknowledge the Mohican and Muncie Lenape Nations, the traditional custodians of the land Andy is tuning in from, and the Muncie Lenape and Wappinger Nations, the traditional custodians of the land Edward is tuning in from. So my name is Kristen Chiacha. I'm the Executive Director and Chief Curator of Second Street Gallery. We're a 501c3 nonprofit art space located in Charlottesville, Virginia. Just a little bit of housekeeping. This is a Zoom webinar, so you can see and hear us, but we can't see or hear you, so sit back and relax. Um, we'll have a question and answer session at the end of the talk. So please enter your questions down in the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen. Um, if there's something that makes more sense to answer immediately, I'll interrupt and um, ask the artist to answer. Otherwise, we will um, try to hold questions to the end and I will attempt not to interrupt as per my usual. Um, <laughs> so for tonight's Artists in Conversation, we're joined by artists and friends, Andy Mister and Edward Holland for a conversation on Mister's solo exhibition at Second Street Gallery, Drawn Out. So Drawn Out opened at Second Street Gallery in our main gallery space on April 2nd and will remain on view until May 21st. The exhibition is made possible in part by Second Street Gallery's presenting partner, Herschel and Adler Modern in New York City. So now a bit about the artists before I hand the floor over to them. So Andy Mister received a BA in English literature. Let's see, can I move to my next slide? Ah, here we go, <laughs> it's working. So Andy Mister received a BA in English literature and philosophy from Loyola University in New Orleans and an MFA in creative writing from the University of Montana. His work has been exhibited at Herschel and Adler Modern in New York, Turn Gallery in New York, Commune Gallery in Tokyo, Morgan Lehman Gallery, the National Arts Club in New York, just to name a few of the many places he's exhibited. Um, his work, Andy's work has been covered in Front Runner Magazine, Hyper Allergic and Quiet Lunch. The Cultural Society published Heroes and Villains, a book of his drawings in the fall of 2014. Andy has been awarded residencies from the Lower Manhattan Cultural Council and the Bemis Center for Contemporary Art in Omaha, Nebraska. Recently, Mr.'s work was included in 2020 at the Aldrich Contemporary Museum in Ridgefield, Connecticut, and he currently has work on view at Rebecca Camacho in San Francisco. So Edward Holland, or Ted as I know him, <laughs> it's, it's, um, it's hard to make that a make that transition. Um, so Ted lives and works in New York City. He received his BFA in painting from Syracuse University and an MA in studio art from New York University. His work has been shown in galleries nationwide, including Miami, New York City, Philadelphia, galleries in Vermont, in Indianapolis, um, Santa Fe, among others. Um, his work has been discussed in Art Zealous, The Huffington Post, and in Eyes Towards the Dope. Along with his studio practice, Holland has almost 20 years of experience working in commercial and institutional art galleries in New York. At present, he's the artist manager and exhibition coordinator for Herschel and Adler Modern, the post-war and contemporary art affiliate of Herschel and Adler Galleries in New York. 
So thank you both for joining us tonight and I will hand the floor over to you. Hi everybody, thanks for joining us. Um, as we get started, I just wanna say thank you to Kristen and to Second Street Gallery for hosting Andy's show and for inviting this, us to do this talk. Um, I think it was a really nice, it's a nice experience helping put it together. And you know, I'd like Andy eventually to sort of talk about sort of, it was nice to have a large group of your work, Andy, together in sort of one space to sort of see how certain things have shifted or changed or sort of the currents and ideas that you've sort of brought to your work over the years. Because in the past, it's sort of been sort of a, a much more tightly focused amount of time that you've sort of developed and sort of worked on a body of work. And so I thought it was interesting to have a much broader selection of work on view at one time. And maybe we just sort of, we can start there. I, I am interested to know your thoughts on seeing everything together at once again, because I would have to imagine it's sort of like once it leaves the studio, it's sort of like, uh, you know, out of sight, out of mind, onto the next sort of project, if you will. Um, yeah, uh, well, you know, also just want to say thank you, you know, so much to Kristen for hosting this and to, you know, Second Street for, um, you know, doing the show and for, you know, working with me throughout the pandemic to, you know, make it happen, uh, even though it, it had been planned earlier and sticking with me. Um, I really appreciate it. And I, I wish I could have been there to see it. <laughs> so, um, but I really, you know, thank you so much. And thanks to everybody who's tuning in and who uh, submitted questions. Um, and thanks to, you know, Herschel and Adler for, Ted and Herschel and Adler for, you know, coordinating everything with Second Street. Um, yeah, I mean, you know, I, I think that was one thing that was, I, I mean, I guess it's weird in some ways, um, it, it's, it's nice to see all that work together over the, the span of about five years or so. Um, I guess the one thing is like my work kind of, even though when it changes, it's still it, in, in that period of time stayed relatively consistent in how I made pieces. So um, they all kind of look like they have still worked together in a way. And, and um, so to some degree, I kind of felt like, well, maybe I should have taken more chances over the last five years. Um, God. But I'm not a big, uh, I'm not like a real big dr drastic shift taker in my work. I mean, I kind of slowly change the way I make work over time. Um, so yeah, but I mean, I think it, it you know, I think around, I guess around 2014 or something, 15 maybe, which I guess now is, yeah, whatever, six, seven years ago. Um, I, you know, when I started mounting work to panel and working that way, um, that's sort of how my work has, has been. So it's, it's been a, it's a pretty nice um, capsule of that, of kind of that period of work for me. Well, so yeah, and that brings up, I, uh, so I came prepared with a number of questions as I joked to Andy before we started this, I sort of feel like James Lipton sort of, you know, bringing you inside the artist studio, but What's your, favorite really, word? What's your favorite curse word? Exactly, I know. I should have written down words and had you sort of <laughs> riff off of them. Um, I am really interested, knowing your history and sort of, you know, what you studied and where you came from, I'm really interested in this idea, for those of you who don't know, that Andy's background initially was creative writing. And I really would like to know what was, you know, studying creative writing, but then getting into visual art, what was that for you? Sort of like, why did you make that jump? And how do you see the creative writing aspect to, you know, your history? How is that influencing work then and now? And is it still a part of like your process? So, you know, is writing a part of your process? Um, yeah, I mean, I don't really, I don't really write anymore. I used to every once in a while, if somebody asked me to write something, I, I would, but I don't really anymore. Um, I mean, I was never like a, a super, um, I never felt like I had like a great facility for writing. I mean, it, it was always kind of hard for me. So um, it takes a lot of time and especially editing. I don't know, it's just, it's just a big time 
consumer. <laughs> but um, yeah, but these yeah. these these drawings aren't. <laughs> yeah, I mean the drawing. I guess I guess that's what I mean is like the drawings take up so much of my time that adding like another thing on top of it to do it even remotely competently would be is kind of hard. But um, uh, yeah, I mean I you know I was really into the visual arts when I was in. When, I mean, pretty much all my life and uh, when I was in high school. And then I, I sort of, um, I, I wasn't a real big reader. <laughs> I mean, this, I guess this is a long story, but I mean, long story short is I, I you know, I kind of got into like reading books like outside of the books that were uh, assigned when I was maybe like 15, 16. And I got really kind of like fascinated with reading and I, and I really, really started enjoying reading. And then when I was in college, I got kind of like fascinated with the poetry, which I'd never really read before. And um, at the, when I got out of college, like I just didn't really know what to do. So I went to graduate school for, for writing. Um, and, but it was all just kind of like, a lot, I, it was just kind of like, I, not, I didn't really think about it that much. You know? And that whole time I was still making art on my own, but it was sort of like a, I, I mean, I guess like a hobby or just a thing I did on the side. It wasn't something that I took like super seriously. And then through like um, writing, I, I kind of came back to being interested in the visual arts. And I, I got really interested in like Larry Rivers and Joe Brainerd and guys that were sort of like uh, artists that were around the second New York school of poet. I mean, I guess the, I guess, Larry Rivers is, is connected to the first, the first and second school of the New York School of Poets. Um, and, you know, it sort of made me feel like, well, maybe those are things I could do in tandem, like I could write and make artwork. And um, it didn't, so anyway, I just, uh, I don't know where I was going with that. But anyway, yeah, so there were just kind of two things I did. And I've always just kind of like, I've never been super programmatic about what I was doing, I just kind of would follow what, um, you know, my inspiration or what was really driving me. So like I wrote this one book called Liner Notes that I, I started writing when I got out of grad school. So like when I was like 24 or five or something, and I spent a couple of years writing that and I was really focused on, I had this idea for like how I wanted to write a book and blah, blah, blah. And, and I did that. And then um, when that was done, I sort of got, kind of burned out on that and started doing the visual arts more seriously. And that's around the time I moved to New York um, in, in, a, in like 2006, maybe. And then when I moved to New York and just saw the galleries and stuff, I just kind of felt like, oh, okay, maybe this is something I could really, um, you know, give, give a shot of like trying to do this. So, um, and then once I, once I started getting really serious about making visual arts, like I just, uh, it just was like, there were these constant problems that I wanted or ideas that I had that I wanted to solve. And um, it's, that's just kind of what it's been like for the last 12 years or whatever that is. Or I guess that's 15, 15 years, 20, 2006. To totally. Do you, do you yeah. feel like you're still trying to solve the same problems? And I ask only because I have this pet theory that inherently artists are, st are, are ask themselves the same question their entire career and you're still dealing with the same set of problems you have your whole career, but what changes is your sophistication of the answer and that hopefully the work grows and becomes more sophisticated and you ask yourself the same problems just in more sophisticated questions. And so I'm interested to know sort of like, what were those problems initially in your work that you were trying to solve and are you still, do you feel like you're still trying to solve them? Yeah, I mean, I guess like for me, I guess what I mean, I, I think about it more like um, like dealing with them, like and this sounds kind of pretentious, but like dealing with like Let it the go. materiality of like the yeah. work. So I would sort of have an idea in my head about like, oh, like I want to do something like this. And then when I would actually sit down to try to make it um, like, you know, I mean, this is kind of a stupid thing, but like I wanted to make these really big drawings and I, I couldn't find like sheets of paper that big. So I started buying these rolls of paper, um, but they were really heavy paper and I couldn't get the rolls flat. So like I actually went, this is back when Pearl Paint existed and I actually went to the paper department and I was like, dude, like how do you get this roll flat? <laughs> you know? 
and they were like, oh, you counter roll it. And they, they show me this whole thing. And I was like, oh, okay, cool. And then I started doing that. So like in my head, I was just like, oh, I did this drawing that was like this big. What if I did that like five times the size, you know? And then like when I actually sit down to do that, it's like, oh, well, I actually don't sell paper that big or they, oh, you don't do that. Or like, uh, you know, what does it mean to like make, how hard is it to make a drawing like and go through like a hundred pencils or something, you know? So for me, I guess it's like those kind of problems. Like they're like, I don't really know the problem in my head until like I start working on it and then yeah. I kind of like run into the problem and then I have to kind of figure out like oh, okay like and you know and I I, I was never in in college in 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 school I've never been good at like the, those kind I don't know what you call that but that kind of thinking like I've, I was never good at math or engineering or any I, I always really had an aversion to that but in my own work like I, I don't mind kind of thinking through things in that way, which is a little bit different than like the, the writing or philosophy way where you're actually just thinking about ideas and stuff that, that don't have any material existence and you're just kind of constantly kind of weighing these ideas or, you know, whatever, so. Um, well, if, so, if, we, yeah. if we initially, if it was more like a material concern, then talk to me about sort of like, how did the, how did you arrive at images? I mean, when I first started, like, I mean, one thing coming out of grad school, like going to grad school for writing and at a school that's like pretty conservative, like in the writing or was when I went there, um, I felt like like a lot of the writing I was, um, like like in that, that book that I wrote, Liner Notes, like that book all starts with like, and, and and I mean this shows how long ago that was, but with the the um, Beach Boys album Smile, which like never was released, and it it has been re released like by Brian Wilson since then. But um, but like where I went to grad school, like if you were like, oh, I want to write a lyric, like an essay, book length essay about like this unreleased Beast Beach Boys album, they just sort of like get get out of here, you know, like you you failed, like you you can't do that or whatever, or like that that's not serious or whatever, you know. So like, I felt all these constraints on like, or, or I felt this kind of almost schizophrenia a little bit where it was like, the stuff that I was really interested in was I guess like this kind of pop culture stuff. And then the stuff that I was being taught, it was either like talk about nature and talk about like reality in this way that doesn't really involve, it's kind of this like idealized version of reality or like, you know, if you are gonna refer to things, you have to refer to like, you know, Wallace Stevens and, you know, I don't yeah. know, Homer, Homer or something or whatever. And, and I felt really like, you know, especially I was young, I was like 22, 23 years old. I just was kind of like, oh, like it just didn't. So anyway, so when I, you know, got into artwork, like, or the visual art stuff, like, you know, I, I felt like it was a much more um, accepting, um, like, milieu I mean which was probably wrong but I had the idea at the time that it was a much more accepting milieu and and I mean I think it is true like as far as your subject matter in the visual arts like you're and, and this has probably even changed in in writing or whatever but like you're you're you you can be much more of like a pick and choose and you, you can kind of yeah. you have a lot more you know it just seems a little bit more open um so in general like especially in the beginning like my, I found my source material. I mean, the other thing too, like that's just cool about art, which also does exist in writing, but it, it's kind of like, it's just different. It's like appropriation in the visual arts and appropriation in writing. It, they, they seem similar, but they're, they're real different, you know? And the way appropriation is accepted um, in the visual arts is, it's much more accepting of appropriation than writing, which is, kind of more looked at as like plagiarism or whatever, you know? Even sure, I mean, it depends not. on the context, right? But it's sort of like, it's like if you're speaking about a lineage, right? And you're sort of lifting a sentence from Faulkner, it's sort of like, I always sort of feel like it's this sort of, I don't know, this wink, wink thing. Like, oh, you know my reference, I know it too. Like, aren't we so insular in a way? But in, in art, like the appropriation is, you know, it it, ha it can have a much different context and a much different meaning, I think. Yeah, and I, and I think it's just, I mean, I don't know. In writing, I mean, there is like a, a whole um, like uh, his, historical 
um, lineage of like actually lifting like full sentences and, and it, like essentially like kind of like collage. And mm -hmm. I mean, I, like my, my real, like I really liked John Ashbery when I was in college and, and like there's this, this guy's dissertation that was published about John Ashbery called On the Outside Looking Out. And one of like John Ashbery is kind of real famous, well, not really famous, but like the book that I really liked was this book, Three Poems. And I don't even know how this guy did this, but I mean, maybe he had access to Ashbery's papers or something, but he like found every single line in three poems that had been taken and what sources they had been taken from. And a bunch of them had, were taken from this like French book like from the turn of the century of games that children could play. <laughs> like it was it was a real like mind blowing thing when I saw like how much of that had actually been like just full on appropriated. And it was really liberating actually. Um, and a lot of like my own writing, like uh, like in um, in liner notes, like there's one whole section that's just like, um, it's, a, it's just like a block of a paragraph and it's not cite, there's no citations. And it's literally just a word for word, um, uh, Thurston Moore's description of this Christian Marclay record. So like, and and I mean, maybe somebody would know that if they read it, but like, you know, I don't know, like in grad school, if I had just submitted that and then I probably would have gotten like kicked out, you know, they would have been like, this isn't cool. You know, you can't do this. Or they would say, oh, you have to have a citation. But I'd be like, well, I don't want to have a citation. Like, I don't, I don't want it to, to be like a, a you know, a, a critical work. It, it doesn't need citations. And they'd be like, well, yeah. no, you know, whatever. So anyway, um, yeah, so I think like, learning about the pictures generation and all that and, and, and their relationship to appropriation, especially like coming out of this kind of, um, like kind of coming to art and like as an autodidact, um, it, it was really, that was also really liberating and like really cool. And it was just like, oh, wow. You know, it, and, it, and, it, and I guess it's like, if you're like me and you're interested, especially when I might, when I was in my twenties, like really interested in pop culture and, um, really interested in kind of the ephemera and like the like detritus of pop culture and the kind of like little weird avenues of, of pop culture that are like lesser traveled or whatever. Mm -hmm. um, seeing that you could kind of make an entire body of work out of that and and not and be like respected or or accepted or you know that was really cool to me. Um, so that's that, kind of how I, that freedom was important to just sort of be able to just sort of mine that territory and not feel judged in a way or in sort of like it, it's totally cool for you to just lift this image or this aesthetic or however you need to yeah yeah just like this feeling where you're like well like everything you're doing is already kind of already been done by warhol so like nobody's really gonna nobody's really gonna say to you like oh hey man you can't do you that. can't do I that mean, yeah, because yeah. you're like, well, like, you know, and, and and I think I've told this story before, but like one thing that was like real um, kind of a, like a kind of opened my eyes a little bit. I was really, I was like super into Katie Nolan and um, th this artist, Tishon Sue, who um, used to, I don't know if he still teaches at Sarah Lawrence, but at the time he taught at Sarah Lawrence and he was friends with a mutual friend of mine. He's a really nice guy. And um, he came by my studio once and we were talking about the work and stuff. and. Um, I was talking to him about Katie Nolan and he was like, oh yeah, you know, for me, like Katie Nolan just seems so, I don't know if he used the word derivative, but you know, he just said, seems so to come out of Warhol that I, I didn't really. And it was like, that was a real like kind of uh, eye-opening moment for me. Cause I was like, oh wow, here's this person that like to me. And, and I think to a lot of people, my generation was like kind of a real like North star influence. But to like another generation, it was like, oh, that wasn't even like, that it, it that was itself that work was kind of dependent upon Warhol or whatever. Whereas to me, like I didn't even, I mean, it, it you can kind of see it when you say it, but I didn't really think of it as like, oh, this is so much like Warhol because it's so different, yeah. you know. So, and it made me feel a little bit less like, you know, when I first started making big pencil drawings, like you know, a lot of people were like, oh, you know, this is just like Robert Longo. I mean, Robert Longo is kind of thinking here all the time, and um, I was a real big, I was more like a Via Selman's fan, and I kind of felt like. You know, if somebody said to, to me, oh, your work is like too much like V.S. Elman's, it would be like somebody saying to you like, oh, you're, you're too much like Jesus or something. <laughs> it's like, exactly. it's like awesome. Yeah, it's like, hell yeah. yeah I'll take know, it. Awesome. Yeah, totally. No one's ever actually said that to me. So maybe that my work isn't that great. But um, I, well, yeah, I think your work I, is really like V.S. Elman's. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Well, I like, you know, as I said, I, I took notes. And one of the things I wanted to get into was this idea of appropriation, because I think it's, you know, 
I think it's obviously there. And clearly, I think the fact that you are choosing certain images to, and I think I've written about this maybe before about your work, but sort of like you're choosing this image and then you're choosing to spend hours and hours and hours and hours and hours drawing it and rendering it. It's sort of like, it clearly means something. There's clearly a reverberation in the image for you. And so I'd love to know more about how you arrive at an image and sort of how, how much agency are you giving to the image or is it, or it, do we just, are we just reading into that? And it's sort of like, ah, the image is the image and I was more interested in this part of it. And that's why I chose it. Cause I think inherently you want to attach meaning to an image in an artwork and sometimes it's completely mindless and it doesn't have anything to do ultimately with the work itself or with the artist's initial intent for the piece yeah um i don't know i mean it's a good question i i don't i don't totally know i mean i think like when i first started making work like I, it's, it's funny, I never really thought about this. I mean, it never really occurred to me, like like the kind of stuff I wanted to draw, like I couldn't go out and photograph it. Like I wanted to draw like burning cars and, you know, like sh streets, like riots and stuff like that. And it's like, I, I didn't want to be like a photojournalist. So I, the mm. stuff that I wanted to draw, it's like, it, I couldn't just go out and, and make my own you know you know what i mean yeah so totally i sort of had to do that and then there was this kind of alternate thing where i was really interested in in sort of images that looked atavistic or like dated or, or sort of out of time um which i also couldn't really compose myself so um and i think like for me i don't know like you know, I guess coming of age, like I, when I did, and I, I you know, we're, we're about the same age, it's like things like sampling were so ubiquitous and it was just, totally. it just yeah, it just, it wasn't like, and I, and I feel like there was this thing where like so much of the music, I mean, like, I don't know, I heard that like little hook from Black Cow, the Steely Dan song, like I heard that in like hip hop songs before I even knew like before I ever heard Asia, you know I mean? yeah, yeah, like, like which is just so weird. But then when, but I so think that, but I think that speaks to, I think that speaks to like a cultural moment, and in, in, in that, you know, I think that for a certain generation of image makers, of creatives, of artists, or just people in general, I sort of feel like there's like this idea of sampling or just sort of lifting things from high culture, low culture, from wherever you just sort of can it's all available to you and it's all just sort of there and you can sort of pick and choose. And so long as it comes together into something that feels fresher, or it feels interesting to you, that, that's valid. Like there's enough of a reason, you know, when yeah. to go back to like what you were saying about graduate school where you would need a citation. Well, you don't, you know, to a certain generation, you don't need the citation. It's enough to just sort of lift it and just to sort of put it in there. And you yeah. don't have to be, you don't have to repackage it. I mean, sometimes the hook sounds really good and you need it. So you put it in there. Yeah, I mean, and, and I think that's like one thing that's kind of interesting, like sometimes like the citation, like the citation kind of ruins it because, you know, you don't have citation. I mean, it, it gets into all this stuff with like, kind of like like Derrida and like Foucault, about like death of the author, but like, the thing is like, th this is the thing that always really kind of like messed with me and like kind of to go back to your Faulkner thing, like this really always messed with me in, in, in writing. And, you know, maybe this is like a real tangent, but it's like, so if there. I full on like take like a paragraph or whatever from somebody, like there's this kind of idea, like this has to be acknowledged, but in in this way where it's like it's like a supplement to the text so you have to have like this 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 second part like either the end note or the footnote that then kind of like acknowledges it right but if i just write an entire novel that is just clearly like to any person um influenced and even like um even beyond influence like not parodying but whatever faulkner i don't ever have to say that it's just it's just accepted do you know what I mean? Like, I don't ever have to, yeah. like, I don't have to put a note that says, oh, by the way, like I'm mimicking Faulkner here. Do you yeah, know what yeah. I mean? But like to some person who has never read Faulkner, they wouldn't know that. 
but yeah. it's like this so it, so it's like this weird and that's the thing that was always really frustrating to me in grad school was like a lot of the higher like the hierarchy between like parody or or influence like hot real serious influence and actual appropriation it's like influence okay full on appropriation no like that's bad yeah. do you know what i mean yeah. but like that yeah. hierarchy didn't come from god you know zeus yeah. didn't bring down tablets or, or whatever and say this it just it just developed out of like the canon and yeah. out of like you know you know whatever like a bunch of tenured professors who told their students well, totally. over like and, yeah exactly. you know and like and then, and like for me as like a 23 year old kid i was just like i don't care like whatever what are you gonna yeah. do like like what are you gonna do kick me out and then i won't get my mfa like oh god forbid you know and and that attitude just was like not you know was not was frowned upon you know what i mean well but, so yeah, but i think it's interesting that you were do you were dealing with the same concerns in your writing that you're dealing with now in visual art right i mean sort of this idea of appropriation this idea yeah. of, you know lifting from somewhere and not needing to be specific about the citation and being able to just present this and if you happen to know where the image comes from great but you're not going to take you're not going to slow down the enjoyment the experience of the artwork to let us know where it comes from yeah, you know what I mean? Like, like and I think about that, you know, even if something is, you know, is baseline is like the title of an artwork. Like when I was in graduate school, I had a professor that was, you know, would always talk about how, you know, use the title to obfuscate the, the intent of the work and the meaning of the work, you know, because when you're looking at a piece of art, you're looking for any clue you can grab onto, you know, and that includes yeah. a title. And so, you know, for me, you know, when I look at your work and I'm around it, I do find it to be very poetic and very slow, the way a poem can be slow. And I am fully aware that these images are coming from somewhere, but it's not something that's not, it's not part of my experience is to sort of figure it out or to know that it helps sometimes, but it's yeah. not sort of like part of it and i just think that's interesting thanks for that, saying that that's a nice thing that's a nice thing oh, yeah, of course. <laughs> but i just think this idea that you know you're lifting you're sampling and you're sort of putting it all together i think is you know i think it's it's fun for me and i think it's fun for everybody to sort of know that sort of like this is where images come from for you you know and that there is no hierarchy for you so like yeah, you're trying yeah. to you know, you're not trying to deal with Katie Nolan's language, right? You're not trying to sort of push that argument further along. It's just sort of, this is just, it almost feels, you know, autobiographical in a way. And sort of, you know, in my own, in my art, I purposely try to use bits of paper or whatever from my life so that in some way it is autobiographical, you know, sort of like in autobiographical in the way that I'm picking this image I'm choosing it, the, that collage element, that image has agency because I've actively chosen to put it in there, right? Yeah, and it can yeah. be formal or conceptual or whatever, but it's sort of like, that should be enough. And that can be enough because if the rest of the image holds together, then, then it holds together. And you're sort of, you're dealing with that and you're just trying to sort of piece it all out from there. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I think a lot about like how, like when I was first starting to make artwork and stuff, and I, I was thinking about this more, like, I think a lot about how we, we interact with images and how sort of like sort of some images sort of come to us, but we don't have, like, I remember reading this, uh, like, interview with Patty Smith, and she was talking about how she had like, this Rimbaud book, which I, it's funny because now, like, I wonder if it was the uh, Ray Johnson cover of, of Illuminations, but I don't know if that's true. You know, and she was just like, oh, you know, I had that book for so long before I ever really understood what was inside of it. But there was just something about like the image on the cover and this feeling about it. And, and I think about that sometimes, like, you know, I, when in high school, I really loved that uh, Francis Ford Coppola movie, the, the Conversation. And whenever I think about that movie, like, I, I sometimes do think of like individual scenes and stuff, but a lot of it is just this, that like the cover, cover. was like, yeah. yeah. And it's like this red monochrome with like a, with a black, like a black image over it, kind of the way I make my work now. And that cover kind of set up what the, 
for me, like what the movie would be. And, and, yeah. and, but, but I don't even remember, like, I, I, I have no idea how, like when I was 16 or whatever, I came a, across that, that movie, you know? So I think with totally. a lot of images, it's like, we, we don't choose how they come to us. And we don't really, even in some ways, we don't even choose which images speak to us and which images don't, you know, it's kind of ineffable. So that's one thing I try to sort of <clears throat> do in my own work. And then, you know, now I, I, not everything is totally appropriated. I've started, you know, I use some stuff now that like I, I've, I've had other people take photographs and stuff. Most of it isn't photographs that I take, but um, so then to kind of blur that line between like what is um, appropriated or what has like sort of a historical situation and what doesn't and things like that. Can you talk about that? Because I think that's interesting. You know, if you've dealt with appropriation and sort of dealt with that kind of stuff, you're for however many years and, you know, you've spoken about how your work is about the act of copying and how information is lost or gained in the act of copying. Do you treat the work differently now if you've essentially sort of ordered an image, you know, like if you are working this with stuff that isn't necessarily found, but sort of, uh, you know, I said ordered yeah. and maybe that's not the right word, but you know, like now you're targeting the image, I think you're, you're prioritizing the image more so than maybe the process as you had been previously. Yeah. And are you treating things differently? Are you relating to the work differently? Yeah, I mean, I think sometimes, like, I guess for me, like now, I, 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 I don't really know. I mean, I, I think it's just like, um, at some point, like my um, catalog of images of what I was looking for had gotten like pretty deep where I was not just looking at kind of either pop cultural things or kind of like historically relevant, you know, things, but just looking for like any kind of, um, you know, any kind of images from like gardening books to like, you know, old books about car, I mean, anything that, that, that jumped out at me and then really trying to like, you know, mess with those images and crop them or invert them and do all this stuff. So it sort of started feeling more like I was composing those images more and more. Oh. And then, and, and I wasn't really finding exactly the compositions I wanted. So I started like kind of reaching out to people who had photographs I liked and they're like, oh, hey, could I do this? Or like, I have a friend who's a florist and I talked to her about like arranging some, you know, florals for me and things like that. So um, I, yeah, I mean, I don't, and then I guess the thing that I try to do is then I kind of try to take those images and kind of imbue them with the kind of feeling that I get from older printed images. You know what I mean? So yeah. you just kind of like, and, and, and to me, it, then it just kind of creates this uh, like kind of a uh, spectrum where everything has this kind of feeling of having a resonance or a personal, um, you know, Re I guess resonance is the best word, or yeah. like, or I guess an aura, like in the ben Benjaminian sense, yep. you know, um, yeah. and, and it kind of, um, and I think sometimes that, like to me that like, I just, I started feeling a little bit like everything felt a little bit too like historically placed for a while, like from the work that I was making. And I wanted to make a uh, work that was more like in and out of history, if that makes sense. Yeah. Yeah. So how do you deal with that idea of being a historical, right? It's sort of like out, completely outside of like a specific historical context. I mean, is that through the image? Is that through the handling? Is that through the color? You know what I mean? I sort of feel like. Yeah. This... Yeah, I guess that's a good question. I mean, I guess it just is. I try to, I guess it's just me. A lot of it is just me trying Find, I guess that's the other thing about appropriation where it's like, you're not one-to-one -one recreate, recreating something like you are changing it. And I guess like, it's like totally. the, the, the legal question of like, if you're changing it enough or whatever, but you know, le putting that aside, um, you know, I guess they're just, just personally, it's like, I do feel like I try to change things. So even like images that um, like, there's this guy, Brian Bowie, who's like been really super nice about giving me, uh, allowing me to use images that he's taken of um, mostly of beaches. Um, 
And cause I, I'm just really pale and I don't go to the beach or whatever. So, um, but you know, I'll take his images and crop them and change them. And, and I, I feel like I'm using them as a, as a jumping off point, but like, I do feel like I, I, I um, change the kind of nature of, of that original image. But that being said, they're really great arresting images to begin with. So they're easy to like, it's, if you have a really amazing arresting image, it's really easy to crop it and still have a kind of nice arresting image or change the color or whatever. Mm -hmm. um, so shifting gears a little bit, um, speaking about images, I would, I know your deep love of music and sort of all things music in indie rock, but I'm really interested to hear about the aesthetic. You're talking about sort of the book cover and the cover to the movie. And and sort of, for me, I think of it mostly in terms of album covers, sort yeah. of like that image because, you know, it's music and you don't really have a direct visual connection to it. I would always attach huge importance to the actual album cover and the packaging specifically. And so I'd love to know sort of your, how much music in, has informed and specifically the packaging of music, like handbills and, you know, punk rock flyers or album covers or whatever, how much that has sort of put itself and influenced the actual handling of the artwork for you. I mean, is that how you arrived at this sort of Xerox aesthetic or did the Xerox yeah. aesthetic come out of something else entirely? Because that's the first thing yeah, I always yeah, think yeah. about is sort of like, oh yeah, totally. I always th think about the punk rock show Xerox flyer that is taped to a built, you know, taped to the wall somewhere, you know, yeah. in somebody's room. Yeah, I mean, I don't, I, you know, th there's this, that guy, Dan Fisher, who makes drawings, mostly they're like drawings of artists um, from like art historical books, but he, I think he coined this term Xerox realism and, and like, um, I've always really liked that, like for my own work, because I don't think my work really looks like photographs at all, but I think they do look like Xeroxes, you know, um, mm -hmm. or can, um, or that's like more the look I try to give them. And um, yeah, I mean, I think like for me, like as far as the music thing goes, I mean, the, the thing that I used to think about a lot was like um, things like punk rock flyers and like that kind of ephemera, like, isn't really made to be dwelled upon and is kind of made to be like ephemeral. <laughs> um, yeah. and, it, and also isn't really, a lot of times it, it's not um, like this focal point of like the, the, the artist's output because the output is like the music and it's just kind of this side thing. Mm -hmm. But for me, like, especially when I was younger and pre-internet and all that stuff, like that was how, a lot of times like the visual was how you got into the thing, you know what I mean? And and um, so for me, I, I would think about, well, how, and I think it's just like this kind of weird backwards way of doing it of like, well, how do you take this aesthetic that's all about like speed and um, multiplicity and getting it out and then making it about like, slowing that down super slow yeah. and then making it about something that's like really singular and only exists as as one thing you you know what i mean and, yeah. and um so that that's i mean that's you know but the funny thing is like i guess at least for me like like 90s indie rock stuff like i was thinking about this like that aesthetic it's not really like my work doesn't really have anything like i guess my work's more like uh, influenced by like either like 80s like the Smiths and like like r the rough trade aesthetic mm -hmm. and then maybe even before that like 70s graphic design and things like that which I think then sort of came back like like with Bell and Sebastian doing all their all their album covers that way um, but the bands that I really liked in the 90s and that when I was like a teenager when I was most influenced by that stuff like they are a lot of them, like there was a lot of hand drawing and a lot of, but it wasn't anything aesthetically like what I what you're doing now. In now, but but it, in the same way, I do feel like with a lot of 
like thing that was so interesting about that was like, you know, you would never, the band would never be on the cover. Like that was a never. complete, no, no, you can't have the band on the cover. And yeah. a lot of times, like if there was a photograph on the cover, it was like a really crappy photograph, yeah. you know? Like, yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and, there, and then it, a lot of times it would be just this really kind of random photograph. Like you'd be like, well, why would you put that on? Like, you know, but over yeah. time, like, I think that I, I could be wrong, but that's kind of what I think of as like the touch and go aesthetic. Like, totally, or like, like the Discord like, record look. It's yeah, sort totally. of like, yeah, it's, like and it goes back to like, it's more obfuscation. It's sort of like, here's the art and you know, here's the music. This is what ultimately what's important, but we're gonna, yeah. we're gonna codify it somehow by, you know, giving you high, low brow mix of things. You know, here's some, again, pop culture detritus that's just sort of like filtered through, but now all of a sudden there's generations of people that have linked this image to this sound or this aesthetic yeah. or this sort of idea sort of cultural idea yeah. you know and i i sort of i i just have always sort of found that interesting to sort of operate that way but you know, again like another thing like another funny thing with like alan car I mean, this isn't even really related to that but it's just funny like you know like i had daydream nation for years i, I didn't know who gerhard richter was you know like <laughs> well totally like, you know? and uh, i mean i think even like i'm trying to think like i i guess when sonic nurse came out i did know who richard prince was but i think there's other like there's other ones like there, there's like a thirsty more solo album that has like a reader rita ackerman drawing on it that i really like actually but i didn't know like who that was so yeah um, I think like that was the other thing. I mean, and the same thing, Mike Kelly with Dirty, like totally. I mean, Dirty came out when I was like 13, I think. Yeah. Um, so like, I guess to me, like, like music and the visual arts were always like kind of connected, but in this way where it didn't have to be in a, like, or sometimes it was an overt connection, like, like Dave Muller, I really love that guy's work. And um, but other times it was just kind of this feeling and a lot of times with like 90s indie rock stuff a lot of it was like just this kind of freedom because you kind of felt like a lot of those bands like they were just doing what they wanted to do and and some of them were really good musicians but some of them weren't and like they, you know and a lot of times the packaging was just kind of thrown together but it still kind of looked had like a vibe that was cool and like whatever and it, it as a kid that really uh really spoke to me I you know yeah. not so much now like you know but back then it really did no because what resonates is this authenticity right like you know you like to believe this is exactly because the budgets are so low you know and sort of the stakes are so low this is exactly what the they wanted it to be right yeah, this is exactly yeah. how the way they wanted to sound for the most part and this is what they wanted it to look like and they put it out there and you know and you could find it and you could access it yeah, and you were kind of introduced into this. Like, I, I was thinking about that with like the touch and go aesthetic or whatever, where it's like eventually, like, I knew what to look for and I could kind of tell if, like, I was like, oh, yeah, this will probably be good. Like, I, you know, you, you yeah, that, exactly. where, whereas, like, when I first got into that stuff, I would, you know, I'd have an album and I'd be like, what, like, I'd be like, why do they just have some like random photograph of a car on the, on the cover? Like, what is, you know, it's just, yes. it was so different than like, you know, Pig Floyd or like Metallica or whatever, which is really branded, you know, whatever. So I don't totally. know. That that really probably doesn't have anything to do with my my own work, but uh, you know, it is something I think about a lot. Well, it's something I thought about too, so I had to ask it. But do you see, you know, this idea of sampling again and sort of like generational touch, sort of like as a moment that sampling? Do you see yourself sort of? going back to this idea of cultural appropriation because it seems like if you're dealing with these photographs and you know working directly with a photographer it seems like you're sort of stepping away from that is that out of like necessity is like boredom like were you just sort of over the sort of you know that appropriation you know what i mean because like you're allowed you're yeah. allowed to grow and <laughs> yeah. move on I, yeah i mean i think i got i, I guess the like the the um the the thrill of like looking for images and trying to really hunt down images got a little like I wasn't as interested in that I mean I've honestly even like like I was looking at Richard Prince's like upstate series of photographs for a while and I was almost thinking like man I should like just take some of my own photographs um you know and just which I've never really had any real 
inkling to do, you know, and, and then draw my own photographs. Like my friend, Alex Bjork does that. Like his are really great. And sometimes I just think, I don't, I don't know. But um, yeah, I think, I, I think for me, like with that, it, it was more like originally it, it kind of developed this thing where I wanted there to be, um, for, for whatever reason, I can't even really articulate why I wanted this, but I wanted there to be like appropriated and then staged and like have that all kind of mixed together, but then all have the visual language all be sort of the same. Mm -hmm. um, and I just, I think like for me, I mean, the big thing for me was uh, like, I was doing a lot of these kind of historical pieces that involve the sixties and, um, and like, actual historical incidents and like the move bombing in the eighties. And people would always ask me like, oh, what's that from? What's that from? And sometimes it was cool. Cause then I could kind of tell people like, oh, like, you know like, you know that Fred Hampton movie came out but I, I did like a drawing of Fred Hampton's murder scene like years and years ago. And like a lot of people didn't know who he was or maybe kind of knew a little bit but didn't really know the, the like, you know the circumstances surrounding his death or whatever. And like the move bombing in Philadelphia like a lot of people don't know about that at all. And um, so that was kind of fun, but I, I just, or like not fun, but you know, interesting for me. And, um, but I felt like I wanted to kind of move away from that. And once I started using, doing the landscapes, which still were appropriated and were appropriated from like old yeah. books and things like that, uh, I got just more interested in kind of creating these like environments, like the, I thinking of the show as kind of an environment. And if you think of that, the show as an environment, the, more so than like a history lesson, it yeah. kind of is irrelevant where the things are coming from or where, you know, if, if the photograph was taken in 1930 or 2020, it doesn't really matter as long as the environment kind of works the way you want it to work. So um, that's, that's sort of where that came from. Was that on your mind when you were doing the drawings for the 2020 show with the Aldridge? No, I mean, well, I guess like for the 2020 show, I, I specifically went kind of the other way where I only wanted to use photojournalism, like only wanted to use appropriated sources. I mean, obviously like I, I, I can't, I couldn't go to Chile and, you know. Yeah, no, I just, and, I just meant more sort of like, this is clearly topical imagery in your handling it the way you handle it, but you knew that it was going to be an environment. You knew that it was going to be ultimately an installation. So did you make specific choices ahead of time yeah, with yeah, the anticipation yeah, that this is now an installation. Like you're worried, you're you're dealing with the environment, and you're trying to control the viewing experience versus in totality versus yeah, yeah. you know making one statement with one image. Yeah, I mean, so that's yeah, total. I, I see what you mean. I mean, well, like those pieces specifically, they were all sort of these like from these protest crowds, and um, oh, I think after this, Kristen is, says there's some questions. So I'll, um, oh, okay, but I'll I'll uh, so but. I, so what I was sort of doing with those was specifically a taking them from like large um, landscape oriented images and then um, cropping them down to vertical images and and kind of taking out like like kind of zooming in on one little section you know mm -hmm. and then and then putting them into a new um, you know a new arrangement where instead of having the the vertical the, the horizontal image of the crowd the horizontal image of the crowd becomes all these different crowds which were yeah. spread across the world you know kind of like that um it becomes a much also, different statement yeah yeah so it was like different so it wasn't just about so to try to kind of make it not just about oh this is what's happening you know in barcelona but like oh this seems to be happening over the last year all over the world like is there something kind of that's going on that's you know behind that's kind of under the surface of all of this and like and then and in the end hopefully that I keep just keep doing that's my hands. I don't know what that does, but uh, you know, in the end, hopefully that's kind of there. <laughs> um, I think Kristen, you, you have some questions. Yeah, so we've been getting, I just didn't want to interrupt. This is such a great conversation. No, totally. but we've Ted, been getting Ted and I could just talk and talk and yeah. talk. <laughs> no, well, we do. Yeah, I know. Yeah. This, this is no different than like any afternoon. <laughs> No, absolutely. So there's been some good questions that have come in and some of them you've sort of touched on already, but um, so someone is asking um, what you, if you have a process for choosing the next image that you draw and if there's, you know, how do you decide if a particular scene or subject deserves like a whole series versus a one-off? 
Uh, yes, sir. Super, yeah, I mean, uh, hmm, that's a good question. I guess like, uh, I mean, I guess some of that, it's kind of interesting. I mean, that's kind of like the, the limitation of like appropriation is that sometimes you might find something that's like, like for instance, like the move bombing. I mean, not like I wanted to do a tons of drawings about the move bombing, but like there's not a lot of real documentation of that bombing. There's like maybe like four photographs or something. And they're a, a lot of them are like really poor quality. So like I, I've drawn this one image from the move bombing before um, and I probably would have drawn another one, but I could never really find one, you know? So that's kind of the, um, the, the other side of appropriation. I mean, things like Mount Everest, like you can find a lot of images of Mount Everest. So I think with the, the like, for instance, like with the mountains, like I did this show at Turn, which was the first time I think I ever did mount, drew mountains. And I just sort of had this idea. I had found this, there's this, this photographer, I think from like the thir late thirties named F.S. Smythe. And I'd found these old books of his and I was really, I mean, they were just like really beautifully printed. And I, I was just like, wow, I wonder if I could, you know, make these into drawings somehow. And, and um, I made a couple and I didn't really plan on making more. Like the, originally I just kind of wanted there to be a couple mountains and then there was gonna be other types of mountain landscapes, but I, I enjoyed it so much and, and, and it felt like such a like mineable body, of, like a subject matter that I just started looking for more and more. And then my friend Charles uh, uh, gave me a book of, about Everest, an older book of Everest that had these really great photographs. So, and, I, and I think the majority of my Everest images have all come out of that book. Um, so, yeah. Well, that's, a, um, that's another question that someone, um, that someone wrote in. And I mean, you did touch on this, your source material, but do you have any other, maybe that you didn't mention, are there any, you know, vintage magazines? Do you go out looking for vintage <laughs> photographs or are there any websites uh, you like using? I mean, I used to use, Flick I used to use Flickr a lot, like early on, but <laughs> they've changed Flickr. Now. I mean, this is years and years ago, but used to be able to like people would upload really big files to Flickr, like huge files and you could download them. And I think they've changed it since then. So I don't know. Um, I When I lived in Brooklyn, there was this old bookstore on Court Street that I think is gone that was really gross. Like it was this cavernous bookstore and it was really dirty and disgusting. And uh, But I used to get a lot of books there. I remember my wife used to make me like leave them in the hall because she thought they had bed bugs. And, and uh, and then she would just made me take them straight to my studio, like wouldn't let me bring out of the house. But um, I got a lot of books from there. And um, and then I used to, you know, whenever I would go to a different town, like I, I've spent a lot of time in Great Barrington. I've shown this gallery there a lot. And there's a really cool bookstore there. And I would like look for books and things like that. I, I don't do that like as much because I just have like boxes and boxes of books and I, I cut the pages out and I'll put them in the files and stuff. Um, so um, and then sometimes like, I'll just, you know, if there's something I'm really thinking about, I'll, I'll, I'll do like Google image searches and then just kind of like see where that takes me and all that kind of stuff. But there's not really any rhyme or reason to it. And so, you know, somewhat related to this and what you've talked about before, um, you know, is there anything that personally resonates with you in the images that you choose of say Mount Everest or the flowers? Um, you know, is there a particular reason why you're drawn to to something or is it just you find a cool image and <laughs> <laughs> yeah I mean I probably like I mean a lot of this is I just find a cool image yeah right? yeah but I you know I think when I was doing like like talking about, like I don't know like I haven't thought for a while about like what led me to like the work that I make now like what I was talking to Ted about and, and um you know I think like one of the things like when I sort of came into making artwork more like really focused on popular culture and thinking a lot about popular culture and then as I was doing that, I started thinking more about like work art historically. And then when you get into like, you know, I guess art history, then landscape and still life are kind of like the two like most kind of basic. So that was, to me, that was sort of the, the interesting problem was like, well, can I take these two kind of really kind of basic or um, not basic, but I, I don't know what the word, you know, fundamental, I guess is the word. Um, and uh, you know forms of, of art, and then kind of use my own, like interpret them in my own way. And would that be interesting? You know, like would that even be interesting to people or to me? 
you know, and like, um, and, you know, that, especially in the, I never really, you know, like, I, I wasn't like a huge nature person ever, you know, <laughs> but then when I started getting to those images, you really do start to see all these kind of, there's just, there's a lot of like majesty and a lot of just interesting things to, you know, in, involve yourself with. So that's kind of how that, how that happened was thinking about that more from like an art historical point of view than as like a strictly, what does the image look like point of view. Speaking to, to, to hold on, I just, I have a question, follow up question for that, just because if I, it's on my brain. You know, <laughs> you say that, and now what I think is interesting is that the work before that, you could draw a line to historic, to like history painting and yeah, like real true. traditional yeah, yeah. idea, yeah. art historical ideas of history painting. And so I think it's kind of interesting to sort of now think of your work in terms of these broad art historical tropes, essentially. That's but true. now you're, you know, but now you're doing it in your way, you know, through your language, but you're still dealing with the same, you know, you're just pushing that, those envelopes a little bit further. That's true. Yeah. I, I never, I didn't really think about that, but yeah, you're right. No. And you know, with the, with the historical imagery that you've used, someone commented, you know, you're mostly using images from times of social unrest and protest. Now, is there an element of, they ask, is there an element of either melancholy for or homage to the historical periods that you're, that you're choosing? Yeah, I mean, I, I used to like my dad, I mean, I don't know if this is like, but like my parents were really politically active. And I remember like in high school, watching that um, documentary with my dad about the weather underground and, and my dad just kind of saying like, you know, at that time, like he really felt like him and his cohort of people, my dad was in the SDS, which was like the precursor of the weather underground, but um, that they really did feel like they could like change the world or at least change like the country. And, um, you know, I think, especially in my, you know, early twenties, I most definitely did not think that me or my cohort of people could change anything, you know? So there was sort of a nostalgia for that feeling. Um, and, uh, you know, I, I, and I guess like, yeah, so I, that, I, in some sense, I guess, yeah, there, there is. And I mean, I, you know, like I was as a teenager and when I was younger, I mean, I was really influenced by the music of the sixties and the seventies and by the culture of the sixties and the seventies. And I, I did feel sort of like, like, I, I guess I would have been one of those people like, oh, I wish I had like, grow I wish I had been around then or whatever. But, you know, now I don't know if I think that anymore, but um, I guess there is kind of, some kind of baked in nostalgia. Um, although my feelings about that as I've gotten older have, have changed a little bit, but. No, absolutely. Now we're, we're running out of time, but I'm gonna try to get to a okay. couple more things really quick. Um, so another <coughs> question is how many other iterations of you, your visual medium and style did you go through before landing on the current Xerox aesthetic? So were you working in a different style before you got to this? Like, how did you make Yeah, uh, okay. Um, well, I guess, yeah, so like when I first started making work like slightly more seriously, oh, excuse me, <coughs> um, I was doing more kind of illustrative work sort of in the vein of Joe Brainerd. Um, so I guess I've gone, yeah, and then, and then that sort of slowly changed and I started making black and white work and I started making pencil drawings and then those got kind of bigger and bigger and then that sort of changed. So I guess it's gone through a number of iterations. Um, and then I kind of, in the last, you know, and then, and then I sort of hit on the kind of Xerox aesthetic and then it sort of, that's kind of mutated over time. And, you know, I, I get, I've gotten several questions emailed and also in the Q and A, but you know everyone wants to know your your big some of your big secrets, and I don't know how you know how much you want to get <laughs> the process, but you know people are always asking you know is, are you using a projector, are you using a grid technique, are you manipulating things in Photoshop first, like yeah. are, what are what is your process? I mean, do you want to, without okay. giving away too it's, much? Yeah, it sort of depends. Yeah, I'm happy to, I don't care. Yeah, it doesn't <laughs> matter. Um, yeah, so like, I I used to project everything with a with a digital projector, like from a computer, um, but I um, I ran into some problems with that because like the, 
it, anyway, it doesn't really matter. But that, I, I used to do that. And then um, I, you can't, I don't grid anything because like you can't really grid on a on a drawing because you'll see the grid through it. And I don't like the way the grid looks. So now actually like what I do is I um, use like, a, usually I use, sometimes I'll use a light box and I'll like kind of trace it through a light box. I mean, sometimes I still will project it and I'll just project out like the, like like maybe I, like I'm pointing, but so I either will project it or I'll use transfer paper and I sort of trace out the outline of the whole thing with this paper that kind of transfers that that outline onto the paper. So I paint the paper a certain color, then transfer this like ghost kind of outline. And then I just draw the whole thing in like left to right. But that way you can capture a lot more detail that a projector kind of blows out and you lose. Yeah. And I think we have time maybe for one more question that you sure. mentioned um, the color. And so that's, you know, do you limit your color choices to a specific spectrum of colors or tones? Um, how do you choose what color fits an image? Is there, do you have a process for that? Like, um, I mean, I don't, I, I don't know. I mean, a lot of times, like, um, I mean, there's a couple of colors that I really like. I really like purple and blue, like those colors, like I just, I like those. Um, I use these carbon pencils and then the, um, the kind of um, like smokier areas of the drawing um, our uh, charcoal or like this vine charcoal and that charcoal because it's um, I guess it's like a natural thing like it has sort of a tint to it so sometimes with the excuse me so sometimes like the base color it can start to look a little brown or it, it can get like an ugly look depending on what the so it, it's the, the I guess the long story short of this is that with the materials that I work, there are a couple colors that don't work super well, like yellows, yeah. orange. I mean, it, it works okay, but it's a little bit more hit or miss. Whereas like red, you're like, you're fine. Blue usually is pretty good, you know, things like that. So um, I, I've tried to like sometimes, like I did this series of flowers um, before the pandemic hit and with those, I was really intentionally trying to like change the color every time and not have we do the color. That was the same as the Aldrich, the pieces of the Aldrich. Um, but I don't really have, um, the way I do the, um, so what I do is like I stretch a piece of paper onto a board to get all the sizing out of it. And then I do a big wash using this acrylic paint, like this liquid acrylic paint. Um, and it's kind of hard to anticipate, even if you do like smaller swatches, how that color is going to be at the end. So some, so I'll just do a bunch of those until I get one that I like. And then I'm like, okay, cool, you know? So it's pretty intuitive. And I, there's so much of my process, especially now that I've been making these even more detailed images that's like not, that's totally controlled. And, and that that part is the, is, it's kind of nice to have something that's like less controlled. And I think, you know, like not to toot my own horn, but hopefully I think that kind of comes out in the work um, where that, that, that ground being a little more um, like it, there, it creates this tension of like a really con tight controlled thing and then something that's more loose and, and you know, ephemeral. No, absolutely. Well, thank you so much. This has been an amazing conversation. I could. I could listen to you talk for another. <laughs> but um, I feel like I'm about to choke, so it's good. It's, <laughs> well, it's then, we'll just have to tune in to next time. So, um, yes. you no, know, I really appreciate you both um, taking the time to to talk tonight. And you know, we have lots of other things coming up at Second Street. The show is on view until um, the uh oh. Looks like, May twenty first. Yeah, it looks like my screen was frozen. So I was like, "Am I here?" Um, show is on view until May 21st. So if you're in and around Charlottesville, please come by and see it. And we have lots of other things going on at Second Street Gallery. We have our next Create and Critique coming up on the 12th and 19th. We have our Gallery Rally fundraiser in the gallery and online on the 15th. And um, we have another artist talk, this one involving the option of making a cocktail with Carmen Smith <laughs> um, on the 20th. So you can visit our website, um, secondstreetgallery.org for more details. And thank you again to you both. And thank you so much, Kristen. Thanks, thanks guys. Thanks for thank you so much. Night, everyone. Thank Good you. to see you, Tim. All right, thanks Bye. everybody for tuning in. Thanks. <laughs>
Bye, guys.